So we are here on the Congress Medical Hypnosis and the Art of Medical Communication. And this topic is in a remarkable way connected with the research you are doing. You did a lot of research and you have been making research about the effect of expectancy on psychotherapeutic effects. You did hypnosis experiments uh, you, and a lot of placebo research, what is your great hobby. And you talked just here about placebo, uh, the effect of placebo. How you have started to be interested in this topic? What was the start? Hmm. Well, the start was many, many years ago when I was an undergraduate psychology student. And uh, I learned first about learning theory. And I was very, it excited me. That's the reason I became a psychology major. And I learned in particular about the learning theory of Edward Tolman. Tolman was a, called himself a behaviorist, but he was also the first and at that time the only cognitive behaviorist. So he believed that even animals, when you put them in a maze, for example, and they learn to run the maze, that this is not just some mechanistic association, that instead learn, associative learning involved, even in animals, the forming of expectancies, beliefs, that the, uh, you put a rat in a maze and what part of what it learns is what the maze is like. It forms a cognitive map of the maze and uh, it learns to expect, oh, the food will be here, or no, the food will be there. And he did many beautiful studies to demonstrate this. So that was the first step. Then I learned about behavior therapy and especially systematic desensitization, Joseph Wolpe's uh, work for phobic uh, for phobic anxiety, for anxiety disorders. And uh, the outcome research convinced me, yes, this seems to work. But the theory behind it was of this mechanistic stimulus response connection. And that I doubted because of the influence that Tolman's work had on me. And I thought, no, I think people are coming in there and they're changing their beliefs about themselves. They're going from believing, oh, I can't be in this situation because I'll have a panic attack, I will have extreme anxiety, to no, I can handle this situation. And that this is what mediates the effect of the treatment on outcome. And that, of course, as an expectancy effect that reminded me of what was called the placebo effect. There wasn't a lot of research on that in those days. This was in the 1970s. Um, but got me to read everything I could find that was written on placebo. And so I started doing research on what's the role of expectancy in behavior therapy. What is the placebo effect and how does it work? And then in hypnosis, What's the role of expectancy and beliefs in the effects of hypnosis? Later you have been looking what effect have uh, antidepressive pills, uh, what is expectancy, what is the belief that it will work, and what is the real effect, and what you found? Well, we found that uh, you give people antidepressant pills and many people improve and the amount of improvement is not is, is, is meaningful But in the same clinical trials the patients who have been given placebo improve Almost to the same degree So people get better, but the difference between the effect of the drug and the effect of the placebo is very small and in fact it's so small that it has no real-life clinical meaning. It's clinically meaningless. And that was the major finding that we had on, that, on those studies. So if you use black humor, you can say it's the only real effect have you have is a side effect in this <laughs> case. <laughs> right. That is not good news somehow. What was the reaction of the, of the clinical field, of the psychiatrist, in getting your and reanalysis of the data? 
Yes, the, the, there's, uh, of course, it was very controversial. The, what, the conclusions of our research were very controversial, and many people in the field, psychopharmacologists and, and psychiatrists, were sure we must be wrong, that uh, we did something wrong with it, and so it's been replicated now many times, most often by people who didn't believe it, but everybody gets the same results that we got. The most recent replication was just a couple of months ago in Lancet, a study that said it was the largest meta-analysis of antidepressants ever done. And they got within two decimal points the exact same drug placebo difference that we got. But it seems it has what I see it has not much effect on the behavior of the prescription of such things, uh, at least until now. You may recall uh, one of the slides that I showed in my talk was about uh, arthroscopic surgery for the knee. And the studies all show that it doesn't work at all compared to sham surgery, compared to placebo surgery. They both have the same effect. In fact, if one works better than the other, the placebo seems to work a little better than the real surgery. That was first published in 2002. The rates of doing that surgery has continued to increase. People do it more and more uh, to the point where now the British Medical Journal has issued a clinical guidance saying this should not be done on anybody. Uh, the same thing seems to be happening with our research and uh, with antidepressants. All of the data show that they have minimal effects. There are many side effects, there are health risks, but that the therapeutic effect is, is very, very small. They, the data also show that other treatments work just as well as antidepressants. Psychotherapy in the short term works as well. In the long term, it works better. The same is true for physical exercise. The same is true for acupuncture. They both produce the same short-term effect, but better long-term outcomes than giving antidepressant medication. But you have a profession that, I remember when psychiatrists years ago used to be involved in doing psychotherapy. Very few of them do now. So what do they have left? They have these pills. And there is a, a saying in English, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. What was also amazing in your talk, all this research now about giving open placebos, what are open placebos and what you found there? Yes, that I think is one of the most exciting things that we have been uh, uh, doing, and that is we <clears throat> give patients with different conditions. This has been done in irritable bowel syndrome and chronic low back pain and fatigue in patients who have undergone chemotherapy for cancer. We give them placebo, we tell them this is a placebo, but it may still work. And the reason it may work is that your body over the years has formed an association between taking a pill or getting an injection and the response to it, getting, have, feeling, improved, feeling better. And so now just the pill itself, just like the dogs that, Pavlov's dogs that uh, uh, learn to salivate when they heard a bell. So we have learned to respond with improvement to the things that the medications are contained in. And what we have found is that we can give people placebos with that explanation. Uh, they take the placebos and they indeed show improvement uh, meaningful, clinically significant improvement in the conditions for which we have studied them so far. Very, very interesting. And also that you found differences, that there are different kind of placebos. You also have to take care that you make the right rituals, the right design, that the show around the placebo. Yes, uh, some what, of what can you, There you have told some interesting stories, the colors and uh, the amount of pills you are giving, maybe you can tell us a little bit about such research. Yes, so, so that's the different placebos have different effects, and it can depend, as you said, on the color of the placebo. So blue placebos are better for sedation, 
for relaxation. Uh, red placebos are better for activation. Dose, taking two placebos are more effective than taking one placebo. If you're told that the placebo is more expensive, uh, you, it's you, more worth, more expensive, it's more effective. It's more effective, so all of those things. And how you give the placebo. So placebo acupuncture, for example, is significantly better than placebo pills. Injections in general are more effective than pills. Uh, and surgery, there have been sham surgeries. Placebo surgery is more effective than any other kind of placebo. So utilizing the patient's belief system somehow. I remember this old study of you when you do two times the same manual, the same treatment. One time you call it imagination, one time you call it hypnosis. And the hypnosis group is better with the same treatment because people, hypnosis is stronger than imagination. Absolutely, and, and, and one of the things that is comforting and helpful and one of the reasons that I remain interested in both fields is there's this commonality. Pl hypnosis is not placebo, it's a different thing, but there's a lot of shared commonality between them. They're both based on suggestion, mm -hmm. belief, expectancy, and what hypnotherapists do, practitioners of clinical hypnosis do, is they have learned to become expert at helping people change their beliefs in a way that leads them to be able to change more effectively their experience and their behavior. When I heard about this open placebo that is so effective, I thought if I look at my own life and I still work a lot in the age where other people are retired already, but if I would have to take two times a day, or even three times a day, at breakfast, at lunch, at dinner, two pills. Even I know it's placebo. I am thinking three times, two times a day, what is my goal to be better. So I make a little bit like a reset. A part of the effect is this going out of the business, taking a pill, and now I work on my headache or work on my stomach problem. I have to take care for this. And if I do nothing, I work and work and work and work. And after two weeks, I wonder I have a problem. Yes. So that is maybe also part of the effect. I think it is part of the effect. And uh, one of the things that I had mentioned that I would mention again is the work of Niels Bache in Denmark who has gone one step further, and instead of giving someone a pill to take, he teaches them to imagine taking a pill. Yeah. Very helpful. They can take it any time, any place they want. They don't have to worry that they've forgotten their placebos and left them at home. They just have to, okay, yes, it's time to take my imaginary pill. I will take two of them, uh, take two of the red pills out. Okay. Well, good self-hypnotic technique. It is indeed. Yeah. And it is a good procedure that could be used with hypno in hypnosis, outside of hypnosis, just like any other good hypnotic suggestion. If it works in hypnosis, it might work a little better in hypnosis, but it can also work without hypnosis, which is especially important for people <clears throat> who might have the talent and the ability, but also some hesitation and fears about the idea of hypnosis. I think it's highly relevant for our societies. We have not enough money anymore. And in a country like Germany, people are getting older and older. This is raising costs in the health system. And we could use the money we have for real necessary surgeries, yeah. for mitral valve reconstruction, for which you can probably not solve with a placebo treatment. Or if your elbow is broken when you fall down from the bike, you need modern surgery. But a lot of jobs, it seems, we can do by our brains. And Absolutely. And there are effective treatments for many conditions, effective medications, effective procedures. But, as you mentioned, there are some conditions for which we don't have effective treatments. There are some conditions that we have a treatment that can help, but the risks are too great. And, and so we want to offset those risks. 
And for those conditions, placebos, and especially open placebos, may be an important solution, very cost if, if, if effective. Yeah. And also, when we have effective <clears throat> treatments, one of the things that we have found is adding placebo, adding placebo pills, even open placebo, telling the person it's a placebo, to the treatment can increase the, eff uh, the efficacy of the treatment. It will be interesting how this research is really going into the society and if it's possible to have to influence the politics, to change the politics and or if we just have to wait until the old doctors are dying and the new generation is using this knowledge. I think it takes time. Medicine can be slow to change, especially um, when people are very committed to a particular uh, procedure. We saw that with the arthroscopic surgery, which is still being done even though it has no effect beyond what happened with sham surgery. You open the person up and you, you close them up again. I think eventually they will stop doing that. I think 50 years from now we'll look back at what is happening today. We would we'll say it's unethical. We will say, we will consider, think of antidepressant medications that we prescribe today as being somewhat similar to the use of bloodletting in the, yeah. in the past. Yeah.